Today my guest is Rich Edwards. Uh, he's a product manager at IBM. Uh, welcome, Rich. Tell us a little more about the products that you're working on at IBM. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Felix. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Um, so uh, I've been with IBM for 10 years, um, and I'm, I'm currently working on the IBM Watson Group around the developer cloud offering. And uh, these are uh, the services that, that we're making available to individual developers you know, in a platform as a service offering around some of the componentized technology that we have around the IBM Watson system. So you may have seen some of the things you know, in the TV commercials or certainly the Jeopardy challenge a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to enable uh, largely independent software vendors and startups and other people who are just generally want to tinker around with it the ability to use some of those the individual component technologies and build on top of it. Yeah, it's some very cool stuff. I think that there's a lot of you know innovation in that space. So it's really awesome to see Eric to have you on and to talk about that. Uh, sure. So you know, I was looking at I was looking at your your LinkedIn and you know the different jobs you've had in the past, and you weren't always working as a product manager. You kind of did different things at different companies. Uh, you know, can you tell us a little more about your past and you know what drove you towards product management? Sure. Um, so going all the way back to undergrad, I had an engineering undergraduate degree um, and uh, I went to school on a uh, army scholarship. So I did ROTC when I was in, in college and then I went in the army as an engineer officer after that uh, and uh, did that for four years um, and uh, d decided I was going to get married to my then girlfriend uh, and uh, she was in graduate school, and so we said, okay, time to her to leave graduate school and me to leave the Army, and uh, we ended up moving to North Carolina, and uh, I started working for Alcatel, uh, for a subsidiary of Alcatel called Burktech, making fiber optic cable, which is a rather large industry specific to North Carolina, um, and uh, worked there for a couple of years, and, and very much like operationally focused, it was manufacturing, and uh, I, I really wanted to get into either a marketing or sales role. And uh, w one of the opportunities to do that was to go back to school. And, and uh, so I went and got my MBA from uh, UNC, Chapel Hill, from their executive MBA program. And kind of did that at nights and weekends uh, while I was still working in, in the plant. And uh, when I was done with that, was really, you know, that was the impetus for me to make this change into uh, you know, a more marketing role. And uh, I, I ended up uh, going to work for IBM, uh, actually hired by a classmate of mine from, from uh, grad school. And uh, I worked in a, in a role that was kind of half finance, half marketing uh, in services. Um, and, and this was in a, a business that was selling uh, hardware. And we had a services practice, so this was kind of like the last mile of configuration and installation work. Um, and it was largely around some of the new technology that was coming out at the time. And it was really interesting and really got my, uh, my interest, particularly in product management, because I worked with a lot of product managers because we were trying to figure out how do we have you know, this new technology that's coming out that there isn't a lot of knowledge around, particularly how to use it or how to get the most out of it in the market, um, and trying to close that gap and really turning the experience we were getting working with customers and seeing how they were using it and turning that into requirements that were showing up in the uh, in the product roadmap, uh, and I thought that was really interesting. And uh, so I started looking for a role to go do that, and uh, I got the opportunity to move over to IBM Software Group, uh, and I worked in the data center automation um, group for a while, doing general strategy, uh, doing a lot of analyst work, uh, a lot of uh, uh, allocation uh, from from a uh, investment standpoint. Some things around M and A. It was really, really interesting work, and uh, then had the chance to go into a business unit and actually get involved in uh, owning a product and, and moving it. Um, you know, dealing with shipping a product and taking it all the way from concept through development. You know, into what was then a a, a uh, adoption of agile development in IBM and particularly in the software business, uh, and and delivering that. And it was uh, that was really, really interesting work. Um, and uh, after a couple of years of doing that, uh, I had an opportunity to go work for this brand new business unit uh, that IBM was considering uh, forming. And it was specifically around the Watson technology and the work that had come out of IBM Research um, after the, the Jeopardy Grand Challenge. And they began to think about how do we commercialize that. 
And they had spent um, a, a lot of time just fielding, as you could imagine, a lot of rather interesting um, proposals and ideas uh, from the market. And the preponderance of them came from the healthcare market. Um, so that kind of led the initial strategy and the, the, the initial work around uh, developing um, Watson-based solutions in healthcare. Uh, the, the, the one that gets the most attention is Watson for Oncology. And that was through uh, a partnership with uh, several hospitals um, and institutions. And it, it's, it's really pretty impressive is this kind of idea about taking things based on some existing technology and machine learning and natural language processing uh, and, and really advancing the state of the art where you, know, you can think of some of the solutions as like the world's greatest research assistant uh, that, that kind of follows you around all day and doesn't really make decisions for you, but makes really, really good recommendations and things that you might have thought of. And certainly in a domain like medicine, where the volume of research, even within a fairly narrow specialization, is so large that no one person can consume it all, um, it, it's, it's really, really impressive to see some of the things that can be done, and, and certainly an area that has such a big impact on it. So, uh, you know, I jumped at that. That, that was just a, a great opportunity to jump over there and and work on that. And so I, I've been doing that for the, the past year, uh, just about since we launched the, uh, the Watson business unit uh, as a as kind of an independent business unit within IBM and uh, started working on the developer cloud. And this was a you know, very different market from where I had, I had been before, where I pr previously been working largely in the enterprise space, um, working with very large data centers, uh, particularly high volume transaction business, um, and shifting over into uh, you know, a space that was largely servicing independent developers. Uh, so the, the persona, the individual users, users we were working with, very different. It was a very different business model uh, where it had been uh, you know, the delivery of traditional software into now cloud services. Um, trying to figure out how are we going to do that with, you know, a rather unique uh, piece of technology and being able to break that down in a way that, that made sense both for how we were building, you know, these larger solutions that we would build privately or with IBM's brand name on them, but also individually for customers that were interested in building individual applications. Yeah, yeah. So you know, so as you're talking about this, it sounds like a lot of your job has been uh, finding th finding technology that already exists or has already been developed and looking for business use for it. And you know, given your background in both having an engineering undergrad and then getting an MBA, do you find that product management can be highly technical where you do need to come up with a tech, or is it more of like a a marketing uh, kind of a marketing like operation or marketing role uh, where you're going out and looking for these like markets or finding business cases or business uses for existing technology? Yeah, that, I, that, that's a, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, and I, you know, the way I would answer that is it very much depends on the type of organization you're in. Um, and, and not only like biz, big business, small business, but also where are they in the life cycle? Is it early on? Is it later on? Um, and you know, one, one of the, the best ways to figure out like what type of role you're in is to look at ratios of things like how many product managers are there per engineer? Cause that's pretty descriptive about what the scope of the role is. Um, I, I want to say it was Ian McAllister from Amazon had a pretty good breakdown on this and had some interesting benchmarks. Um, so one of the, on the lower end, if I if I remember, uh, you know, very technical, very close to what's going on, much more feature function related would be Microsoft from an enterprise standpoint. And I want to say the ratio was something around three or four engineers per product manager. Um, so you kind of see the, you know, the, the reach of, you know, how far are you going from people who are actually writing code? You know, what's your relationship to those? How close are you? Um, and you can look on the higher end um, around where the role is going to be much more strategic um, is going to be something over 10. Um, and that's the type of role where you're one step back and you're not looking at things from, say, an individual sprint standpoint or, an individual feature standpoint, it's going to be more 
uh, let me think of the high level strategy of really more at the individual problem that we're solving for customers and, and to use the, the uh, uh, agile terminology, you know, you live at the epic level, you know, in that type of environment. So it, it, it's, it's a lot about the type of, the type of company, where you are in, in your life cycle, and certainly how the, uh, what your organizational looks like. Yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, and it seems like you know when you were trying to get your not that maybe you weren't necessarily trying to get a product manager role, but once you got to one and you're looking back on your career path, it seems like you were inching closer and closer to product by doing things or you know uh, being involved in more projects or working with more departments that were more and more related to product management. Do you find that that is a typical career path for somebody that wants to get into product? Is that they you know see kind of or maybe have this kind of drive towards being more hands-on and uh, mm -hmm. being more involved in the development of the product and then just kind of trying to find more roles that move them closer and closer to to that role? So, you know, a lot, a lot of questions I get sometimes, you know, being a, a uh, you know, a manager of product managers where I'm, you know, I'm part of the role is hiring product managers um, is what's the career path that gets you there? Um and I never have one straight answer for that. And, and the reason is that, you know, you look at the domain of everything that you need to do as a discipline of product management. And it's, it's fairly broad enough that you never see one person totally cover it. They may be able to cover it for a while or they may be able to cover it during a certain life stage. But when you think of it as, you know, there's an element of technical expertise and really under this understanding the technology of what you're doing, um, plus understanding the market that you work in um, and the individual customers you're dealing with, and then understanding maybe the specific domain of within that market that you're serving, um, you know, that's a pretty broad, diverse set of skills, set of understanding, set of experience. Uh, that that type of role demands. And so, you know, I look at it as uh, you're usually building a team of two or three people that are overlapping sometimes in what they're doing. Uh, if not individual products, then certainly responsibilities for the entire business. Um, and uh, to that end, you end up hiring people with different backgrounds. Um, so if I look at, you know, my team now and the teams that I've managed in the past, it's a pretty diverse group. You have people who have come in from, um, you know, very technical roles, either developers or architects or uh, uh, product service or support standpoint. People who come in from, uh, you know, a more straight marketing background, you, you know, who would not be comfortable doing things from a command line or writing code, um, but really understand the market and maybe how we go to market and can talk to the uh, talk to the uh, to the individual customers, and then you have people who are actually customers. Uh, I've done that once or twice with with some pretty good success of people who had been users of your product uh, and have and have come in that way. Uh, each one of them had their own strengths um, and certainly came at it from a different way. So uh, you know that's that that's one of those angles of you know you should never feel well I, you know I only have technical experience. I, I don't have any sales experience, so I can't be a product manager. And that's certainly not the case. It's certainly not the case the other way. Um, and that it's really a fit for what the organization needs at that time to help move the product along and keep it relevant in the market. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about, you know, getting that job and preparing for uh, or, you know, depending on what kind of skill sets the company's looking for, what do you find is kind of the most um, important skills to have as a as a product manager? What kind of skills do you think are most in demand right now for for companies that are hiring product managers? So, um, I mean, so so the, the way to answer that is to think about what product management does. Uh, and, and why product management is, as a discipline is important to an organization. Um, and when you think of product delivery, there's really kind of three main disciplines. Um, and, and this goes back to kind of the, the thinking around like design thinking, right? And you have, you have technical development roles that are really geared towards feasibility. Can, can we do what's being asked of us and can we deliver it? And then there's, there's design and design thinking where you start thinking about it from a user experience standpoint. And is the thing that we're delivering, is it desirable? 
Is it a pleasurable experience working with our product? And then you have product management, who's really about um, differentiation. You know, are we doing something that's important to the market, and are we going to remain relevant to them, not just with this release, but the next release and the release after that? You know, are we are we staying on a path that's going to keep us, uh, you know, essential to our customers, or are we going down a path where they could probably pick from five or six different competitors and it wouldn't really matter? That's really where you're going to add value as a product manager. So to that end. Um, Really, one of the most important skills you can have is uh, being able to understand the market that you serve, being able to understand your customers, uh, really having true empathy for them and the problems they deal with. Because um, you find that a lot of times, uh, while you, you know you, your day to day and what you focus on is about solving a rather well defined technical problem, uh, in the eyes of the customer, the problem you're solving is a lot of times more deeper than that. Mm-hmm that there's often uh, a lot of uh, emotional content to it, right? Um, you know, you can think of some technical things that you could solve where, you know, given this input or given this state of where a customer is, we provide this, you know, very well-defined fixed feature function service to them. But what you find is what you're often doing for them is making them relevant and important to, say, their boss in an organization. And it's like not looking dumb in front of their peers, you know, it's like those type of things that you really do for them. Um, and when you think of it at that level, that's where you really get that relevance for what you're doing. You're, you're able to, to uh, provide for them something that they can't get anywhere else, uh, either at the price or in the model or in the method that you're delivering it to it. And, and that's when you've really keyed in on something that's important. Yeah, th- that's a really good point, you know, because most of the time, you know, IBM is being a product manager. At IBM, I think, for the most part, is more of a B two B kind of, uh, I guess, a product mm-hmm. manager role. And a yeah. lot of uh, other people looking to get into a product manager role, uh, they usually look at B two C as the company, as the types of uh, product management jobs that require you to think about the emotions of the customer. But you know, at the end of the day, even at a B two B company or B two B. Uh, like software company, you're still selling to a person at the end of the day and a person at the end of the day is still making a purchase decision or making a decision to continue to use a product or not. Yeah. So, you know, you still have to think about um, their emotions. And, and one thing that you mentioned that I hear all, <clears throat> over and over again is the, the empathy, being able to understand the problems that your customers have and, and being able to understand what they need and want to to help them through their day, like you're saying, to, to look good to their boss. And, and that, I think it was the, the very, I think it was the IBM back in the day was the, the popular phrase where you don't get fired for purchasing IBM or something like that. Is that, <laughs> I think it was like, you want to make sure that your customer at the end of the day is happy with their, with their decision, regardless if it's a consumer or, or a business. Yeah. And, you know, to, to that end, do you spend a lot of time or do your product managers spend a lot of time with the customer or what is, what is their, how do, how do they interact with the, sure. the, the end cu- customer? Yeah. 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 So, uh, just, just to go back to one point, uh, you know, you think about the difference between B2B and B2C. Um, and I, I, I really believe that the only difference there is in who's paying the bill. Um, that uh, in in B two B the only difference is you know they're trying to justify an expense or a purchase, um, which is sometimes about money and sometimes about personal reputation and risk, but they're trying to justify it to somebody else to making their boss happy. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, the all the emotions wrapped up into it, very similar. Not a lot of differences there. Um, so we can get into the difference between the user persona and the buyer persona, but but. You know, it's not it's not like it's a, it's a completely different discipline, or you're looking at it differently. Um, but as far as uh, as far as the, the customer interaction, that's a really big part of being a, a product manager. Um, n- not so much from say just doing straight like user testing and seeing people use your your product, which which is important and a part of what you're doing. But it's also understanding kind of the context around what they're doing um, when they're using your product and really the problem that you're solving for them. Um, so, uh, you know, I spend a, a good chunk of my time, I would guess somewhere between uh, 20 and 25% would be a good guess, right? About a day a week 
is a, is a good average. It's sometimes lumpy, um, particularly when you kind of lump in going to um, uh, like big conferences um, or or meetups, you know, where you'll spend an inordinate amount of time talking to a whole bunch of customers at once versus just doing like one on ones. But uh, that's really, really key to what you're doing because really, again, the, the value that you bring here is understanding that customer and what they're dealing with. And, and depending on the market, those things change over time. Um, the, the nature of the problems uh, will change over time. What alternatives they have uh, to solving those problems will change over time. Uh, the type of market that you're addressing will change uh, as time goes along. And it's the, there's a lot of... Uh, angles around how fast is that changing, and that kind of dictates, you know, how much of this research you're going to have to do. Um, but like I said, it, it 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 becomes one of those things that it, it it's a struggle um, in that you have to do it, and you can't uh -huh. stay relevant if you don't. Yeah. But if you don't manage your time and you're not able to prioritize it, you can very quickly get caught up in the kind of nuts and bolts of, of what you're doing and, and become very inward focused, right? Focused yeah. on your own process and your own product and your own company. Um, and if you find yourself doing that as a product manager, you're likely on the path of becoming irrelevant because you're, you're, you're not there as kind of the advocate for, look, this is really important to our customer. Um, and when you look at things, well, a lot of the methodologies, and I'll, I'll talk to the Agile methodology because you know I'm somewhat familiar with it, um, the, the idea of having very crisp, well-defined personas, you know, like the first time you deal with, with like a, like a well thought out persona and you go in there and they have like a picture of some guy and he's got a name and they talk about where he went to school. You're like, well, this is silly, right? Cause that, this is all manufactured. This isn't a real person. Um, but you begin to think of them that way. Right. And so when you kind of come to this decision, uh, that invariably you do where it's not a clear choice, you know, do we deliver this feature or this function or do we delay it or do we take an alternate course? You find yourself saying, um, you know, well, you know, Joe Smith is our persona. W would Joe like this decision or wouldn't he? You know, and you have these like really silly debates about Joe and what Joe wants, but it kind of forces you to say, let's look at it from the side of our customers, Right. And if, if we're making a decision that's good for us and bad for Joe, then maybe we need to back up and rethink this. Right. That That's um, definitely a great approach to think about just one person rather than a bunch of statistics and, you know, a whole mass of people. And, yeah. You, you know, when you – what like you're saying, you spend about one day a week uh, actually interacting and talking to customers, and I think that um, that's something that you know, doesn't happen enough. And you hear that a lot now in the in the um, the product manager space about how do you have to get out the office and not spend mm -hmm. so much time, yeah. you know, working in the business rather than working on it and finding ways to you know grow it and and make it align with where what your customers want and need. Um, you know, but what what do you actually do? Like you know, once you go into the office, I think that that's a um, an experience that a lot of new product managers or aspiring product managers are not, uh, you know, they, we don't get, they don't, we don't get taught that. We don't really learn like what kind of questions to ask, how, what to talk to customers about. Like, what's your goal when you go in, and how do you kind of accomplish your goals? This is this is talking to customers. Yeah, talking to customers. Sure. Yeah. So so there's, I mean, there's a couple angles on this. Um, you know, if you don't know where to start, one of the best ways to deal with this is uh, with however you do this, get involved with your support organization. Whether that means spending a day a week for the first couple of weeks or a month, just just dealing with with customer support. Go answer the phones. Go deal with uh, you know the Zendesk queue. Um, go in there and solve their problems. And, and if best, meet with them. You know, spend time with them and understand what. Why, why have you reached out to us? What is your problem? What isn't our product doing? Uh, and talking to them. And then get into the, you know, so why is this important to you? Why is this, and sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. You know, and that, those, those are always good questions to have. Um, but you, you because begin to feel that, you know, build that experience and understanding of what's going on. Um, it, it's always good to, like, as you said, get out of the office and actually go visit customers and not just your customers, but maybe competitors, customers, or other people that fit your market definition that, uh, you know, haven't bought something yet or using a, an alternative that 
they built themselves or it's, it's, it's free or it's cobbled together, right? Like in, invariably, uh, every software solution that, that, that I've run into, there's somebody doing some version of it in a spreadsheet somewhere. Uh-huh. Um, and really kind of talking to that person like, okay, you have a problem that's so important, you're essentially building your own solution around, spending a lot of time doing that. Why, what are you doing and why is this so important to you? And if you can really get to the base of those problems and understand what it is, that, you know, that's, that's where the real insight and the magic comes from. Because then you can turn around and be able to turn that into a requirement. And when you have a good list of requirements going and you can be able to go out and test those, uh, you can come back with some level of credibility to go into your business and whether it's you know, your, your product development organization or, or your engineering organization or some higher level to an executive, be able to come in and, and speak authoritatively about what's important to the market and, and, and not do it in a way where it's, it's, uh, it's debatable. I mean, that's one of the hardest things, right? You, you kind of go in there and you go, well, I think this is the most important thing to do. Uh, and depending on your standing in the organization, that may work and it may not. That may be an easy, uh, an easy argument to knock down. But if you go in there and say, okay, I've talked to 200 customers and 75% of them say this is their most important unmet need um, that they would be willing to buy a solution for today. Nobody, ar- nobody argues with that. Right, because you, yeah. you've done the work, uh, and there, there's there's an, an old adage I remember hearing from an executive that said, you know, he who names customer wins argument, uh, mm-hmm. and it's you know when you can bring the voice of the customer into that you know decide, decision process, uh, that carries more weight than anything else than any one person's individual opinion. Yeah, that's definitely the the one thing that I think has made my job as a product manager much easier is to have data and to have the person that's putting the dollars down, the people that are paying for the products, to have mm-hmm. their opinions and have their thoughts in. Uh, to just some degree, you're really just a conduit for for them and for to have them, you know, voice their to to voice uh, you know their opinions for them to back mm-hmm. to the, back to the organization. So you know, we've covered like you know one day out of the week for you, which is you know working with and talking to and and uh, understanding the customers like what else is your your week made of like what does your typical day-to-day look like sure so uh, you know it's 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 one of those those type jobs that um if you like to come in and do the same thing every day this is not for you um because it's so varied it's so different um you know if you kind of lend yourself more to being kind of peripatetic and having to do something different all the time then this is a very interesting job uh, and, and part of that is, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're really solving, uh, these very complicated problems, right? How do we bring this market, this product or this solution to market in a time that makes sense considering what our customers want, what we're able to deliver in the time frame allotted to us with the amount of resources we have? Um, and also considering uh, what our competitors are doing and what may be going on in the market from a technology standpoint. I mean, th- those are a lot of different moving pieces to kind of keep, keep track of. Um, so it it's, tends to lend itself as to be very complicated problems you're solving. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, it, if you're really taking charge of the product and really fulfilling everything that you can as a product manager, you're ultimately responsible for all of that. Even though probably most of the resources to accomplish that don't directly report to you, um, so there's an there's an awful lot of uh, work that's done between organizations, and typically product managers work uh, you know a lot with with development and uh, engineering staff, um, a lot with sales and support, um, and then some with other parts of the organization, marketing um, in marketing communications if that's a separate part of the company. You're, tied in with PR, um, uh, other aspects of, uh, of your delivery process like legal, um, like finance, like pricing, putting together business cases. And those are, are not one of those things that you're constantly doing. You're either coming up with new ones or coming at it from a different angle, um, dealing with a, you know, a new release or a new idea. Um, and you know, soliciting feedback and building consensus from the people who could potentially say no to what you're doing. Yeah, um, 
I was going to ask, you know, so you're saying how a job as a product manager is, a, it sounds like it's just a huge balancing act and you're not doing the same thing every day. Was that, did you know that going in or like what, what is something, I guess, what is the thing that most surprised you about the role before you, you got started that you didn't expect to run into? So I, I didn't, um, I didn't really appreciate from the outside looking in, um, how much influence you can potentially have uh, as a product manager. Um, so, and again, my, my perspective here is somewhat skewed as, you know, having never worked in a startup or a, a, a small business, but having worked in, in largely enterprise most of my career. Um, and there's, a, you know, from what I've seen, certainly with our customers and everything, there's this inverse correlation between uh, the amount of assets and resources you have available and the amount of autonomy you have. Um, so, you know, at the very high end, you think of a company like IBM, um, we have a tremendous amount of resource available, uh, from a sheer manpower standpoint, um, but also from the depth of technology and things like IBM research, which is my entire product line came out of, um, but then when you get to that level and you know you look at your your business plan and there's a whole lot of zeros on the end of it um there's a lot more people who have to sign off on something like that there's a lot of more people who have some slice of responsibility um and so you know it it ends up being very much uh you're making your case uh to a, a pretty wide court um around that so you know building Building alliances and, and being able to um, you know negotiate through the different process elements of what you're doing becomes a a, a big part of the role um, and you know having to build a, you know a network like that and have uh, credibility in a group a fairly diverse group um, yeah that was that was something I didn't appreciate coming mm. into it. you yeah, know that's... How, how much you kind of had to really play for lack of a better term, politician, Politics, but not yeah. necessarily in the, in the, the negative sense, right? right? It's more, you know, you really have to be able to convince people from very different backgrounds who have different incentives for how they support the business um, that what you're doing is the right thing to do. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely something I've heard before that the, the best product managers are also good politicians. And like you're saying, not in a negative kind of connotation that it has kind of gone over in, in the recent past, but it's more about how do you show people that what you want to do or where you want to be is beneficial for them or beneficial for, for yeah. the business. Um, and do you have any tips on how to, how to actually, you know, build a case like you're saying, or, or working for resources and getting people aligned with the same goals that you have? Sure. Yeah. Um, so it, it's never easy and it's never straightforward and it's not the type of thing where it's step one, step two, step three. Um, it, it always starts with having done your homework and really understanding your market. So again, being able to come in and say, I have done the research, I have talked to the market, this is what's going on. Um, and, and not really just saying, well, I, I have an opinion that you may not think is very well informed. And so it's easy to say no to, but coming in with the facts, being able to be, make very fact-based decisions um, and you know, make the case around things in a very unassailable way. Uh, is a good start. The other thing is much the way you have to build empathy for your customer is you have to build empathy for who you're dealing with inside and, and understand that the way you see the business and the way you see the product is not the way they do. Um, and that often for very good reasons, they have different incentives. Um, you know, someone who is say, um, from part of the finance department, um, may alternately be very much incented around us attaining a revenue amount and then conversely about containing costs to a certain level and making sure we meet goals. Sometimes those things align and sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes you find people that are, are very much about avoiding risk. Uh, and again, for very good reason. You, you need people who are looking out for that. Um, but you know, they kind of care about one angle of this, but not really the other ones because of how uh, you're organized or how you're incented. Uh, so being able to understand that there is a diverse set of requirements or concerns people have and being able to address those individually uh, and, and, you know, 
not have to rely on fairly weak arguments about why they should listen to you, um, but really addressing their core concerns, right? Because much the way, you know, that idea of the difference between B2B and B2C, everyone's job is ultimately to make their boss happy. Mm -hmm. And if you can understand what this person's trying to do to make their boss happy and align that with what you're doing or change what you're doing in a way that it makes their boss happy but also achieves your goals, that greases an awful lot of skids. Yeah, that that's that, that totally makes sense. I think understanding like what's the core motivation for your your end customer it can really guide you in the right direction. Um, and so once you you know have an idea of what you want to, uh, what your customers' needs are, can you walk us through the the product management process at IBM and what's the development cycle like and how the product manager fits into the process? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So. So, I mean, typically, I mean, I'll describe very cleanly, you know, from beginning to end, but it never works like that, right? Because you either come in midway through the process or you've got three products that you're dealing with and they're all at multiple phases. So it's not like you kind of get on the train at the beginning and ride it all the way through. It's yeah. you jump on at some point and that always, that, that's difficult sometimes. Um, but really, you know, it kind of starts with, with a very clear articulation about what the market need is um, and who you're solving it for. And you kind of get to this point of being able to um, build a case for, you know, what are the, what are the jobs that we're being hired to go do? Um, what pains are we solving for them? And, and what's potentially the gain that they get out of it? And, and you always kind of gear towards the solving a pain, right? Because, um, you, you know, you have the old adage about is your product a, a, a uh, an aspirin or a vitamin? Uh -huh. um, nobody quibbles over price for aspirin. They may look twice for vitamins, but man, when you got a headache, you want that thing to go away. And your price sensitivity and, right. and maybe the objections that you have around it, those vanish very quickly. Yeah. Um, so you kind of start at that level, understanding what that is. What is the thing that we need to do to go solve that? And, and then it's going back and looking at, like, what are we capable of doing? Um, what technology do we have? What skills do we have? What relationships do we have in the market? Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example in this case, uh, specifically for Watson. Um, we have now built uh, both through the Watson Initiative and the existing life science business in, in um, IBM, uh, essentially the right to sell things in the healthcare market. We can sell solutions to um, largely institutions, but to the, to the medical industry, and they will buy things from IBM. There are industries where IBM has no business selling anything. Um, you can kind of think of like the consumer market, right? Uh, IBM would have a very hard time selling a consumer product, particularly since we no longer sell uh, PCs anymore. Um, you know, when was the last time you know, you as an individual bought something that had the IBM logo on it. Yeah. Probably, ne maybe never, right? Yeah, maybe a ThinkPad so, or something. Right, exactly. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of those areas where it's kind of understanding like both from not, not just your channels, but when is somebody actually going to go, oh yeah, no, I know them and I would buy something from them because I probably bought something from you already. Um, so being, a, being able to serve the market, making the market addressable Having you know, essentially the right from the sense of the market standpoint, uh, the, the ability to sell to them. So you, you kind of begin to like narrow things down here. Um, and so once you kind of got the concept down, th then you start getting into the nuts and bolts of actually product, um, product uh, development and product delivery. Um, and as a product manager, the, probably the most important thing you're doing here from you know, developing the roadmap as far as these are the discrete things we're going to do and when we're going to do them is writing requirements. Um, th this is this is a hard skill for product managers, um, and uh, it, it's often a difficult one. It can be elusive um, because if you're not an or an organization that's very well disciplined around this, um, they'll let you get by with really crappy requirements, um, requirements that are non-specific in the language they use, right? non-specific language about what you know better or faster is mm -hmm. right the, the onus is Not on you is to define that you know what is what does faster mean i got to do this in less than five minutes 
you know, this type of UI should have a sub-second response time. Uh -huh. that, that's how specific you need to be in developing um, uh, requirements because you need to be able to hand, hand something to your, your engineers to go build right. that's that specific. This is what winning looks like. If you do this, we will win. And it, and it, it can't be wishy-washy. You really got to be able to understand what you're doing at that level of granularity. So part of that discussion about you know going to customers and talking to them is is kind of smoke testing that even before you put it in the roadmap, you know it kind of behooves you to go talk to you know developers and say, well, I, you know I have a I have an idea here of what we might do. Let me describe it to you. I'm not asking you to do it, but let me describe the problem to you. Now, given that, do you think you could go build it, or what questions do you have, right? And then you start to get the well, you know, could we do it this way? Could we do it that way? If we use this technology and we deliver it this way, is that going to solve the problem? And either you'll be able to know enough about the problem to say, oh, yeah, no, here's the context and why that doesn't work or why it does work, or you've just got more questions to go ask the market, right? And this is the indication that you don't know it well enough yet. So, you know, it's really, that's the, that's the hard part. And, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, the nuts and bolts of individual development processes whether it's Waterfall or Agile or Agile XP or, you know, all the different methodology. From a product management standpoint, it doesn't really matter. Uh -huh. um, it's can I give them requirements on the front end, let them go build it, and then work with them on the back end about testing, you know, did we actually do this for the market? Did we do it in, in you know, the time and the way that it's, it's going to satisfy the needs for that problem? And are we right. doing it in the concept of our, our overall strategy that it makes sense of how we play in the market why we win and how we're differentiated from our competition and alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's definitely um, you know a great overview. And so, if someone's out there is you know looking to get their first product manager job, or either they're out of right out of school, or maybe has worked in the technology um, kind of industry for a bit and wants to transition into a product manager role, what are what do you what would you say are some key things that they should focus on to make them look like a, or to make them become a a you know ideal candidate? So, I mean, one thing you can do if you're in a company that has product managers is kind of do what you're doing here. Sit down and buy them a cup of coffee and say, tell me your story. You know, what, what's, it, what's it like? What are you dealing with? You know, what problems are you dealing with right now? What's, what's your headache? Um, and, uh, you know, think through how could you help that scenario? Because, uh -huh. uh, you know, for, for me as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a hiring manager, one of the one of the best interview techniques. Once you kind of qualify, you know, yes, you have the knowledge, yes, you have the skills, you have the attitude or the experience that we need. Um, I, I'm going to bring you a problem that I'm dealing with. Right? We're, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk through something that I'm currently dealing with that I don't have a solution for. And, and if I present you a problem and you got nothing for me, yeah, okay, wait, nice try, but probably you know you you've just disqualified yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, if you kind of bring me a solution that the team has already come up with, that, that's that's a good sign, right? Like you are you are su you sufficiently smart enough, sufficient understanding of what's going on uh, that you're you're running at pace with everyone else in the team. If you bring me something new and novel that we haven't thought of before, um, that looks like it's going to add value that no one on the team has come up with, you just got pushed to the front of the line on the whole thing. Um, so, you, you know, really understanding where, where that team is sitting and what they're dealing with, um, and what new ideas can you bring to the table? Cause this is very much a, uh, a you know, a knowledge worker kind of ce cerebral type role, right? You, you got to come in with your brain fully engaged in what you're doing. Cause you know, as I described before, you're, you're dealing with like very complex fluid problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, they're, they're not discrete. Um, there's always multiple solutions for what you're doing. Um, and very rarely is it, is it obvious to any of this? Um, yeah, yeah and, exactly. Yeah. That's where you add the value because you got to come in and find the solution and then not only find the right solution, but that convince a fairly broad set of stakeholders, both inside and outside your company, that this is the right move. 
Yeah, and I think one of the great things about uh, getting a job as a product manager or applying for a job as a product manager is that it's a it's a meritocracy. You know, if you can prove they can do the job because there's no necessarily like a pedigree or like a uh, a school necessarily that you can go to and mm-hmm. and you know just transition into a product manager job. I think a lot of the the hiring that's done is really dependent on showing that you can do the job. And I like to always say to aspiring product managers that if you want to get the job, do the job before you get it, and you know yeah. prove that you can do mm-hmm. it you know and you know going along those lines i think i hear a lot of um product managers or, or uh, companies are hiring product managers suggest that side projects are really important like being able to show yeah. that you can build something like what's your opinion on that like in, in you know how can a uh like what should a candidate do to to in terms of a side project to really kind of wow you in you know blow you away when it comes time yeah. for them to come in so, so th- I mean, that's a that's a great suggestion. And, and if you're working in a company that has product management, I, I will tell you, like any product manager that is sufficiently engaged in what they're doing, has ten or fifteen things that they would love to do that they can't. Mm-hmm. And if you can come in and solve that for them or help them with a side or a pet project they're working on, great place to start, right? Because you can kind of think of it as a very long interview. Um, now, if you're not in a in a company, you don't have that type of relationship, or you, you know somebody's not going to be able to bring you in on what they're doing because you're outside. Um, actually, actually building a product and shipping something is key, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? It could be a blog as a product, but being able to talk about it that way and say, "I understand my market, and this is why I made the decisions I did." And how I developed a solution to solve this specific problem for these type of people—that's um, a great example. Um, so, I mean, Felix, look at what you're doing, right, with your with your program here. You, you know, you're looking at at solving a problem for a part of the market that is not served at all, um, where you have you know uh, relatively new in their career folks, maybe just out of college or maybe just in their first job, and they're looking to get into this type role. And there really is no guide for them out there, you know. And so th- this is an unmet need in the market, uh, and and you're providing a service here to help them with that, to bridge that gap. That that's an excellent example of that. Mm-hmm. And and being able to understand, you know, why you do those things and what makes a good decision, and talking about what you struggled with and the the difficult decisions you had to make. That that's very much what that role is like. And even if it's you know relatively simple or maybe even something that you're you're not even charging for but you have a metric for what success is and can talk about things at that level that really demonstrates a lot of the acumen that this role requires yeah and it sounds like you know as you're talking about this it sounds like a lot of product managers need to have that kind of entrepreneurial self-starter spirit in them where they can take an idea because a lot of people can come up with ideas ideas are you know really easy to come up with but then the hard part is how do you execute on it how do you mm-hmm. how do you you know figure out what's uh, what what you, what you should prioritize what you know you can wait on and how do you you know make it sustainable i think that those are really all key you know kind of um uh, traits that make a really good product manager mm-hmm. and you know to kind of close this out you know do you have any kind of um you know if someone came up to you and said that hey i, I want to apply for a job at, at ibm as a product manager you know what kind of advice would you give them what should it be focusing on let's say that if they have like a few months of preparation to put in like what sure. should they be focusing on yeah I, you know certainly do your homework um you know that's the the base piece do do the research do the the google research do the linkedin research understand who the players are um but then really get into the market uh understand what's going on in the market who are you serving uh, what are the problems they're dealing with that really, really important? What are the general trends that's going on? And then take it to the next level, right? Actually go out and do some interviews. Um, I, I will tell you I am floored when somebody comes in and says, uh, you know, I talk to people in the market who are dealing with this problem. Maybe they're existing customers or potential customers. But here's the insights that I've gleaned from talking to them. You know, I'm actually coming to the table with a head start. At, you know, not that I know nothing about what you do, mm-hmm. but I've actually sat down and tried to figure out what the problems are, um, and try to, you know, come to it with with an idea about where where uh, we should think about going as an organization. Where the product should be going. What are some different angles on this? And really looking for that like novel thought that's in there. Um, yeah. And certainly not rehashing, you know, ideas that are out there. But what's the next thing? Because again, 
the, the, the value of what you do is keeping your product relevant in the market you know, a year, 18 months from now. What's going to happen in the future? Um, it, it's one of those funny things about um, product management, right? Because you, you could go to probably any organization and fire all the product managers um, and nothing bad would happen right away. Um, but eventually what you would find is without somebody doing that role, um, you drive to obsolescence, you, you drive right. to commoditization of what you're doing and you're just doing what everybody else is doing. Um, and there's a lot of traps there. E even straight up listening to your customers can lead you in that path, right? Because if you fall into the trap of just saying, well, you know, my job as product manager is to just take all the requirements that our customers give us and put them in order for development to go execute on, you're not doing your job. Because you're really not understanding the market, you're not understanding what's going on with competitors, you're not understanding how do you reach what in most markets is a fairly broad set of opportunity that is totally unaddressed by what you're doing. And if you just consider you know, your existing customers as a captive market and how you're going to continue to make them happy and you know, in, in a lot of cases just you know, milk the support money you're getting from them, you're not doing your job, you're not staying relevant to what's going on. Right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rich. Thanks for sure. sharing you know, your experience, you know, especially from like a larger product management organization. Um, if you know the folks that are, are listening, uh, if they want to kind of learn more about what you what you've been doing or how your your career path and and you know the IBM specifically, or maybe they're interested in applying for jobs, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Sure. So I, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, Rich Edwards Watson should get you there. Um, I certainly t take a look at, at uh, if you're kind of interested in Watson and uh, uh, in particular, ibm.com slash Watson. Uh, and if you're, you're interested in what I'm doing, particularly around developer cloud, it's ibm.com slash Watson developer cloud. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rich. Sure, Felix.